Hi, everybody. Thanks for braving the rain and coming out early. Um, I've got a clicker here. Will that, will that do it? I see there's, OK, great. Um, so Baobab Studios, we're a brand new, we just started last year, brand new company. Um, and we have um, our first uh, VR story that's uh, going to have a uh, world premiere at Tribeca Film Festival in April. Um, but just to give you some context, I'm going to show you a little clip from that film now. Not in VR, obviously, but it'll give you a sense of what I'll be talking about. All right? So you can roll the video whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, so in that experience, uh, if you're on a higher end headset like the Oculus, when you look down, you have a bunny body, and uh, it follows you as you look around. And um, if you move your head in a, you know, translate your head through space, when the bunny or the aliens are looking at you, um, they maintain eye contact. Um, so it does make you feel like you're there, and you understand why the bunny is interested in you, your partners in crime and sort of saving the planet. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today, is the stuff that we think we learned making Invasion. Um, you know, I come from a film background, and obviously, a lot, as a lot of you guys are aware, you know, VR is not the same of film. It's a brand new medium, and really, even though I'm going to be saying stuff that I think we learned, really, I don't think anybody really knows anything in VR right now. There's so much to discover, and there are so many unknowns. It's such uh, a medium in its infancy um, that um, I try to keep an open mind. Here's some of the things that um, I've been told. Uh, you can't have cuts. They're like teleportation. Well, I've already seen cuts now. Uh, and, and I believe there's plenty of opportunities to make that work as they work in film. You can't accelerate the camera independently of the viewer's movement. Uh, it causes VR sickness. Um, this is, at least right now, for me, it's kind of hard to refute. When your eyes and your ears are getting two different signals, your brain uh, makes the decision that you are sick, like you've eaten something that's made that's poisonous and is causing this disconnect and, your, and makes your body nauseous so you throw up the poison. Um, I don't know how we do that until we can hack the inner ear, um, but I have some ideas and I can't wait to experiment with how perhaps I could alleviate this. One interesting thing is that there's a lot of people in the VR industry in particular that sort of wear this badge of honor that, well, I don't get sick 
and it's sort of like, why don't you babies sort of pull it together and, uh, you know, deal with it the way I can. Um, well, I discovered there's another badge of honor. The University of Wisconsin did a little bit of a research into this and found that, uh, yes, people do respond differently and have different varies, variations of sickness with VR, but the people that get the sickest are the people who have um, the best sense of depth perception and judging things as they move away and move toward you. Um, so I guess the better your sense of depth, the more this uh, experience can affect you physically. So I guess that I'm really good at depth perception is what you can say as you're throwing up. Um, all sound, including music, must be part of the world you're in. You know, I heard this from a guy who's really invested in sound in VR, um, and yet um, I tried this, where we spatialized the sound all, all around the viewer, the, the score that you heard there, and um, you have to be very careful. We'll talk about that. Uh, pacing must be slow. Oh, wait, I skipped one. Physics must be realistic, or immersion is compromised. Well, we didn't really uh, maintain true physics, and animation is all about exaggeration, and so I hope at least on some level we can disprove that. Um, pacing must be slower for VR than it is for film. Um, Comedy doesn't work in VR. Actually, I heard somebody say, um, well, I tried to do this VR comedy, and when I finished it, nobody laughed. Therefore, I've shown that comedy doesn't work in VR. Um, so be careful about what other people say. The best thing to do is to test things, obviously. Um, of course, beware of the gee whiz factor. Right now, as we're creating content for VR, you know, just the fact that you're standing on a frozen lake is enough to blow people's minds if they've never put on a VR headset before. So at least today, and hopefully not forever, you do have to give, I think, the audience a little bit of time to settle into these worlds that they find themselves in, because the whole thing is just mind-blowing for the inexperienced. Um, now, some other things uh, is this idea. That should be playing, and it's not, but it's OK. You can see one snowflake there. Um, <laughs> James Cameron sort of invented this term when he was making Avatar. But if you have little objects in your world floating around and sort of helping you sell the idea of the depth, that can be just as compelling as anything else in terms of really believing that you're in this environment that has this volume all around you. Um, we learned that two images every 11 milliseconds is really hard. Um, this is what you have to do in VR. You have to deliver these images to the audience's eyes. Um, and if you don't do it, you just lose that frame forever. And a lot of my team comes from the feature film world, and that makes it even harder for us, because all of those beautiful images that we're used to taking 11 hours or four days to render, um, now we have to find these clever ways to do it in such a short amount of time. And it reminds me of the early days of, if the, 80, if the late 80s were the early days of, of computer animation inter entertainment, then I was there. And it reminds me of those days when um, nobody knew how to do anything, and everything was a discovery. And um, it really is the Wild West, and it's it's one of the reasons why I love um, getting involved in this medium right now. Sound is so critical in VR, and um, if you watch the VR experience uh, with our, the bunny sort of appears from that little hole in the, in the rocks, and again, I'm sorry, the video's not playing, but there's a little scraping sound. So if you're there looking at this world and it's snowing and you're being blown away by the clouds rolling by, this little sound from the, your left um, draws your attention. But what we discovered is we had to turn it way up because people were so caught up in everything that was happening around them that we turned the sound way louder than you would ever think that it should be. But that actually was enough then to pull the viewer's attention over and pay attention to what we wanted them to see, which was that bunny coming out of that hole. Um, but sound for, for you know, inspiring the viewer to look where you want them to look. And as a director, I'm kind of like a magician in a way, and less like a director. You know, it's sort of like, voila, you know, look over here, or clap, clap, you know, this is where you need to pay attention, or even um, using other elements inside the scene to visually um, uh, compel the viewer to look somewhere. Um, it's okay for characters to get up close and personal. This is another law that somebody told me that the characters can never get too close to you because it'll invade your personal space and we know how important personal space to us, to, is to us in the real world. But of course, invading someone's personal space can also be a really powerful thing. So why would you ever say never ever do it? Um, eye contact. 
This is an amazing thing that you can do in VR that you really can't do in film, at least with the same effect. You know, in film or, or theater, this is called breaking the fourth wall. But in VR, there are no walls. So when the character looks at you, that's actually what they're doing, or that's how you perceive it. And it can be a really powerful way to feel this connection with this character. Um, and breaking eye contact um, is also this great tool that you have as a filmmaker or a VR maker. Um, because when that character looks away at something, you're just naturally compelled to look over and see what it is that they're looking at. Um, and this is one way that we can really direct the eye and make the viewer feel like they are in control when, in fact, you know, they're puppets on a string. Um, so a musical score. Um, some people said that they just don't work at all. Other people have said that you need to put it in the space. Well, when I spatialized the sound so that the orchestra was all around the viewer, uh, it became very tricky um, because it was just distracting. Um, it would take a lot of fine tuning to get that sort of thing work and not feel like when some of all the instruments drop away that suddenly now you just have like strings coming from over here. And that's what really makes you want to look over there. So the idea of spatialized sound is really cool idea and I couldn't wait to try it out. But when I spoke with Scott Stafford who is a sound guy who, who did all the work for Google Spotlight Stories, um, he said that he actually found that a stereo mix that was really tight that almost put the music in your head was actually less distracting than, um, than having it around you. And you say, well, when do you ever experience that kind of thing in the real world? Well, I guess often we do all the time when we're walking around with earbuds in our ears. But um, sound, however you put it in there, I think, I'm sorry, music, however you put it in there, can have a, um, a really big impact on what you're doing and really, I think, take the viewer along in what is a sort of a cinematic experience, which is what we're focused on at Baobab. Sound can kind of come back and bite you too. I was really excited. You saw that shot where the, uh, for where the spaceship comes over the trees. I thought this is a great moment to really build up. So we'll let that spaceship hide behind those trees and, and then we'll just build this sound as it gets closer and closer to you. And you'll hear it and it's spatialized sound. So it's coming from right over there. It's coming from right over those treetops. And um, after about two or three seconds of this, pretty much every viewer, they started by looking at the treetops, but when they didn't see a ship, they started doing this. And then about 80% of the people when the ship came over the tree were doing that. And, and by the time they came back, the ship was over their head and they missed the whole thing that I wanted them to see. And so we actually truncated that time significantly and found the right sort of timing so that about 99% of the people, um, just when they're starting to look away, the ship appears. And so we get less of that buildup, but the buildup doesn't matter if people aren't paying attention to it, obviously. Um, so you saw that moment where the bunny runs behind you and sort of uses you as a human shield, well actually, I guess, a bunny shield, and um, is hiding behind you while the aliens are coming out of the uh, spaceship. Um, this was a really cool thing for about 80% of the people that watch this. Some people turn around, they check, out, check in on the bunny one time, and they never have to look back again. Alvy Ray Smith, who's one of our advisors, said how profound it was for him to know and just almost feel like this bunny was standing right behind him and he felt like I never had to look back because I just, I looked once and it was there and afterwards I just felt her presence behind me. And he thought that was a really powerful thing that, um, that VR can do that, that other media may not be able to do. Other people found that like they didn't know what they were supposed to be looking at. So there's the aliens, but there's the bunny, but there's the alien. So, so what do they look at? Now, that's a compromise I'm, I guess I'm willing to accept. Um, what we did do to try to alleviate that stress as much as we could is that when the bunny goes behind you, she doesn't do much at all. She just sits there, looks at you, looks at the aliens, looks at you, at the aliens, you, and that's all she's doing. And hopefully, my hope at least, is that most viewers would look at that long enough and go, well, she's not gonna do anything more than this, so I might as well pay attention to what really matters. For most people, that works, but it's something to be careful with. Well animated characters are always worth it. Um, and I can let you read that stuff, but a lot of people talk about empathy in VR and how VR has this automatic like ratchet up the empathy, you know, that you get for free um, because you're there with the character. And I almost would argue that 
because you're there with the character, you actually don't get that empathy for free. Think about your most profound experiences consuming entertainment. That's a horrible way to describe it. But um, watching a film, you're not required to do anything except look at the screen. You just sit there in the dark and you pour your body, not your body, but you pour your soul into that character on screen and just let them go and take them wherever, take you wherever they will. And then before you know it, if it's a good film, you care about what they care about. You want for them what they want. You cry when they cry and you laugh when they laugh. And my most profound emotional entertainment experiences have been in cinema or books or the kind of entertainment where the viewer is basically essentially passive. So if you think about games, when you're in a gaming world, and VR and games, by the way, is a marriage made in heaven, not something that we're focused on. But um, in a gaming environment, you know, you want to talk to characters and you want to connect with them, although typically the motivation is different. I want to get to the next level. I want to, you know, find out the information that I need to get from this character so that I, I can move on. And rarely, if ever, is it uh, a desire to connect with a character on an empathetic level. Um, and I think that VR is a little bit like that. You're in this world with that character, so now you're not just projecting your entire heart and soul onto this other character. You're there making choices, making decisions. What should I do now? Did I just give that character the right um, advice? Um, you know, are we heading the right way? And suddenly now your focus is split because you're part of the story. And I think that that actually will make it perhaps a little bit more difficult to empathize with other characters than it might in, you know, a cinema or a book or theater. I mean, even in real life, a lot of times it's difficult for us to really connect with another person or in a room full of people to connect with others because we're constantly sort of judging where we are and how we relate. And it just sometimes, at least for you know, the more empathetically challenged people like me, um, it becomes more difficult. But in a film, you can just let it go. Storyboards matter. I didn't do storyboards on this project, and it really came back and bit me on the ass. Um, storyboards are a great way to clarify for your team what the emotional beats are in the story, what a character is thinking. In no uncertain terms, every acting moment is there in black and white on paper. It doesn't have to match the layout or the cinematography um, or where you expect the viewer to be looking or anything, but it really does need to tell your story. And, um, you know, if there's any example of why or how that worked, if you look back at the early days of Disney, animation, the storyboards were never cinematic. They were never describing the shots. They were never describing the environment. They were characters on a white background expressing their emotions and communicating what was going on inside their head. And that's really valuable. Credits are not straightforward. Yeah. How do you do them? You know, where do they come from? Um, if it's a scroll, you know, where, what, the, yeah. So, you can't just throw text up onto a black screen like you can in cinema. It's, it's something that takes a little extra effort. It's something that just kind of caught me by surprise because I never bothered to really think about it when we were going into it. Oh. Oh, good. It didn't go. Think twice before you kill the bunny. This, to me, is one of the biggest discoveries that I made. And it came from, I was at the Future of Storytelling conference back in New York City in the fall. And we had done a short teaser for... Um, for the film, and we didn't have time to animate the bunny. So, at the beginning of the story, which wasn't shown here today, the little bunny comes out from the rocks, and, um, and a hawk swoops in, uh, the hawk that gets killed later, and uh, the bunny manages to evade it and runs back into the rocks, and that was always our intention, but we didn't have time to animate that. So instead, we had the hawk come in and grab the bunny by the head and take him away, <laughs> off over the trees. And a lot of people thought this was funny, dark humor, and we did too. Like, that's so great, maybe we should just kill the bunny in the actual, in the actual show. And then there was this mother that came through, well, I didn't know she was, she was a woman that came through. I didn't know she was a mother. And she took the headset off. And she goes, that was great. I really loved it. But you know what? I've got a five-year-old daughter, and I don't think I would want her to watch this. And I asked her why. And she goes, well, because you killed the bunny. And, um, you know, I said, well, but it's kind of funny. I mean, what do you mean by that? And she goes, you know what? If I was in, the, in a movie theater and that happened and you killed the bunny, you know, the adults in the audience would laugh at the dark humor. You know, the kids would maybe be a little bit, you know, 
appeased by that. My daughter could turn to me and say, Mommy, what happened to the bunny? Or whatever her question would be. And I could answer that question however I wanted to. But in VR, you are all alone <laughs> in this world. And it is so real. And she said, that would just devastate my daughter. And I would not be able to help her through it. And it was a really interesting um, insight for me. And it sort of pointed to some of the um, bigger and more significant differences between virtual reality, at least as it is today, and, um, and other forms of entertainment like cinema or theater. Okay, so what do we call this? What do we call narrative visual reality experiences? We have names for books, you know, movies, plays, that all works fine. What are some of your favorite nat narrative virtual reality experiences? That doesn't trip off the tongue in VREs either. What if you just tightened it to VREs, kind of like DVDs maybe? But, but to me, that would be a little, it's a little broader if that stands for virtual reality experiences, which could be anything. Could be journalism, could be uh, education, could be medical. And so I'm still looking for the, for the term that can define um, what it is that I'm trying to do, which is character-driven storytelling um, experiences in VR. Uh, I spoke with um, Kevin Kelly, founder of Wired Magazine, and he said, how about reallys? My answer to that is, really? I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, how am I doing on time? Can you give me a show of fingers? Am I done? Okay, two minutes. Um, well, uh, I've rushed through this. I hope uh, it wasn't too qu quick for you guys. I'm sure it wasn't. I don't have that much to say. But I do want to say that all of this stuff and all of these discoveries that I've made, um, you know, are just, just the bare bones and the beginnings. And anything that, that I say I feel like I can't do, uh, I'm waiting and hoping for people to come and, and show that it can be done. And just like, you know, the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of hours of film that have been shot over the last 130 years or so, and you look at the difference between, you know, the photographs that Moybridge shot to settle that debt about whether horses' feet ever come off the ground, and the films that were in um, the Oscar ceremony a week or so ago, um, and see how far things have come. For me, that's what's exciting about VR. Not the fact that we can just stick you in a world and you can look around and go, wow, it's snowing. Um, which is much like a lot of the original film work where it was like, you know, picture of a, a film of a stage play or of a juggler or something. But I'm really interested in what's the language of VR that's going to transcend, that's not going to be a reality experience at all, but it's going to be an experience that transcends um, what we know of as reality, but gets to something deeper. Um, the way that films can do and the way that books can do. Um, and we've got a lot of time to do it. I don't think, though, that it's going to take as long as it took for film. I Probably in the next, uh, before the end of the century, if not the next decade or two, we'll all be on the holodeck together and all my questions will be answered. So thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. <laughs>